evening, everyone, and welcome to Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies. My name is Jim Perenni, uh, and on behalf of all of us at Georgetown, I'm uh, honored to welcome you to this, this very first guest lecture in our, our brand new facility and in the auditorium here at SES. Uh, before we begin, uh, I want to recognize and thank the leadership of SES and some of our neighboring institutions uh, for joining us this evening and for their support for our event. Uh, first and foremost, the Dean of the School of Continuing Studies, Dr. Walter Rankin. Thank you, Walter. <laughs> our friends, colleagues, and students uh, who are joining us from NYU, thank you very much. And of course, our students, faculty, and staff uh, at Georgetown School of Continuing Studies and the Semester in Washington program. Thank you. We gather tonight in the midst of an ongoing international debate on Syria. While there has been nearly universal condemnation of the chemical weapon attacks on the people of Syria, there are a wide variety of thoughts on what to do next and how possible action by the United States could impact that region, global peace, and security overall. On Saturday in Rome, Pope Francis led a five-hour evening of prayer service for Syria and St. Peter's Square. The Holy Father challenged the tens of thousands gathered there to rethink the approaches to conflict as the fighting in Syria escalates and as the United States and France contemplate a military strike. Such prayer services were taking place all over the United States as well, including services here at Georgetown University's Dahlgren Chapel, which I know some of you attended. Dr. Jasser is, I'm sorry, uh, President Obama uh, has stated that intelligence reports show the Assad regime and its forces preparing to use chemical weapons launching rockets in the highly populated suburbs of Damascus and acknowledging that a chemical weapons attack took place, resulting in the deaths of well over 1,000 Syrians, many of them young children. Tomorrow evening, President Obama will address the nation and outline his specific plans for limited military action in Syria as Congress returns to consider action and the nation is divided as how best to proceed. Our traditions at Georgetown welcome such discourse. As President DeJoya has expressed, an engagement in public discourse about the common good, a commitment to dialogue carried out with civility, respect, and appreciation for those with whom we need to engage, even those whom we might tend to disagree with. And undoubtedly, if we were to poll the audience here tonight, we would find a myriad of thoughts regarding Syria and how we should proceed there as well as in the entire Middle East. This evening's guest lecturer obviously has a deep personal point of view in this debate. Dr. Jasser is himself a first generation American Muslim whose parents fled the oppressive Ba'ath regime of Syria in the mid 1960s for freedom here in the United States. A devout Muslim, Dr. Jasser founded the American Islamic Forum for Democracy in the wake of the 9-11 attacks on the United States as an effort to provide an American Muslim voice advocating for the preservation of the founding principles of the United States Constitution, liberty and freedom through the separation of mosque and state. He is also actively involved in the Syrian American community as the co-founder of Save America Now, Save Syria Now, which was formed by Americans of Syrian descent seeking aid, relief, and immediate intervention from the United States in Syria. Dr. Jasser is the author of A Battle for the Soul of Islam, an American Muslim Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith, and a leading expert on the politics of Islam. He regular briefs he regularly briefs senior members of the House and Senate on these issues and was recently appointed by the United States Senate to serve as the vice chair of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Dr. Jasser earned his medical degree on a U.S. Navy scholarship at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He served 11 years as a medical officer in the United States Navy with tours of duty 
including service as the medical department head aboard the USS El Paso, which deployed to Somalia during Operation Restore Hope, as chief resident at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and staff internist for the Office of the Attending Physician to the United States Congress. For his service, Dr. Jasser is also the recipient of the Meritorious Service Medal. Please join me in welcoming this evening's guest lecturer, Dr. Jasser. Thank you, Jim. It's a uh, pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dean Rankin and Professor Blakeman, for having me. Um, what tough times we're living in. Uh, it is uh, amazing to me that uh, we started this work after 9-11, many of us, uh, though my work within the Muslim community started from when I was young and in high school and then in college, but uh, my work outside the Muslim community sort of taking these issues of reform, you know, how we counter the root causes of terrorism uh, really blossomed after 9-11 because we realized that uh, this war, this conflict, uh, the, these groups had followed us here and were a threat to the country that gave us freedom that our motherlands could not give us. What I want to do is just uh, uh, hopefully spend some time with you uh, uh, at the end answering some questions, but spend just 20, 25 minutes uh, going over first Syria, obviously, because that's on the front pages, and tomorrow the president will be speaking on it, uh, laying that groundwork. And then looking back, there, there's an old Arabic saying, my, my father used to always say, and it's a lot more artful in Arabic, but uh, the, the saying basically says that uh, when you point at the moon, the idiot looks at the finger. <laughs> and you know, this is, this is the problem with our policy, with counterterrorism and also with Syria is right now we're, we're looking at the chemical weapons and the president is making up for two and a half years, 29 months of a revolution where we were basically missing in action and now all of a sudden he's trying to get public opinion and the Congress engaged in a conflict. We're seeing now, you're seeing an attention to a conflict where, as uh, Jim mentioned, we formed Save Syria now in April 2011, four weeks after the conflict started, after the massacre happened in Dar'a and Idlib, we knew that once it had gone, the, the revolution started peacefully. Once it transformed into people being shot in the streets, being pegged like ants and cockroaches, and having 100 to 500 being killed on a daily basis, and now we're at 110,000. We knew that within weeks, once it went violent, there was no end to this other than when you had the human assets on one side end. And the Assads are 5 to 10% of the population that are part of the Assad regime, and the other 80% of the population that are not part of the Assad regime, that includes 65% Sunni, 10% Alawite, 10% Kurds who are also Sunni, and then Christian community, which is 10%. Initially in the first year of the conflict, it was not sectarian. You had Christians demonstrating, Alawites from major cities that were Alawite, like Latakia and other cities in Syria that were also demonstrating. Uh, you had a non-sectarian component for over 12 months. And then in 2012, Assad starts releasing Al-Qaeda from prison. He starts bringing in and allowing Jabhat al-Nusra and many Al-Qaeda into Syria to sort of foment this old page one of the Arab dictator playbook is when, when all else fails, you unleash the gates of Islamic radicalism hell upon the community and that allows the justification of emergency law. Every country in the Middle East, whether it's a monarchy or a secular dictatorship has used that card when they want to uh, uh, snuff out any type of dissent in their population. And sure enough, into this revolution, uh, that's, the, that's the card that uh, Assad used. It's a card they had used in, in Hama in 1982. Uh, Hafiz Assad Bashar's father wiped out 40,000 people in two weeks, claimed it was a Muslim Brotherhood uprising. Sure, there was brotherhood in Hama, uh, but when they use ultimate solutions like that and drive tanks into a town, it caused Syria to become basically the North Korea of the Middle East. Uh, I remember reading, you know, folks from a lot of think tanks around here in 2008, 2009 writing, you know, Syria will probably be the last country to ever change and then once the Arab awakening started happening in Egypt and Tunisia in 2011, they said, well, Syria will probably be the last country to have a revolution and because there was this portrayal of the Syrian community as being basically very passive and non-political because of their generations uh, over 43 years of Ba'athist control. And ultimately that changed. But the Syrian people, when they rose up, 
knew that it was a one-way street. There is no political solution to fighting a regime like the Assad uh, regime, and ultimately that solution will have to be the surrender of one side, and, and the, the opposition will not surrender because they have nothing to lose. They go back to their homes, they'll be wiped out quietly over the next few years. We were saying this three months into the revolution and we continue to say it. And ultimately, this is why you see the death rate continuing to mount. Uh, they will not stop until the Assad regime you know, gives up. And they won't do that as long as they're getting armed. And I guarantee you that Assad would not still be around if it wasn't for Iran and Russia. Iran has been not only funding it, but providing boots on the ground in Syria. Uh, somewhere between 10 and 20,000 are confirmed to be boots on the ground from Iran. And Hezbollah has also provided uh, uh, arms and rebels to, uh, to fight the other side of the rebels. So ultimately you have what we're characterizing in America now as we finally have this conversation about Syria is being characterized as two sides that are both bad. And all I can tell you is there will be courses taught about what actually happened in Syria. Uh, but that narrative is wrong. It's not two bad sides. Yes, there's Al-Qaeda now that has been empowered. There's probably Israeli intelligence says between five and 10,000 Al-Qaeda. Then you have the Islamic Liberation Front, which is 37,000, which are also not good guys. My litmus test is if they're there for a jihad against Assad, they're not our allies. But if you look at the rest of the community in Syria, you've got somewhere between five and 10 million Syrians as parts of what we call local coordination committees that are very chaotic, very unorganized, but have been slowly trying to help this uprising to shift, if you will, from their inertia of their uprising to allow the, the um, sort of fractionation and the dissolution of the Syrian military. And if you look right now, my family tells me, I have family in Damascus that are 10 miles from where the chemical attack happened, family in Aleppo on my father's side, my mom's side's in Damascus. For every 3,000 military that are called up for the draft in the past few months, 10 to 20 are showing up. So that tells you, Assad's human resources are going to end. There are defections happening on a daily basis. It's going to take now, I think, without, you have our president talking about shots across the bow. I mean, this is not the way you talk to a, a Arab thuggish dictator. You know, you don't say you're going to shoot. You either do it definitively or you don't get involved. This is not, you know, this is not a game. We keep talking about game changers. This is not a game. Our families on and off, don't have food, don't have electricity. Their, their homes, the reason that people say, well, why don't your family leave? Now they can't. I mean, you've got millions. You've got displaced four million Syrians displaced in a country of 22 and a half million. So they have nowhere to go. And the ones that leave, when we told them to leave a year and a half ago, they said, well, if we leave, our house will be gone. And that's true. They've seen other people leave and go to Turkey or Saudi Arabia or somewhere else. Their homes immediately get taken over by, and I'd say our policy right now and please, if anybody knows what the, you know, every president has a doctrine in the Middle East of what they approach. They call it, you know, the Bush doctrine was the freedom agenda. You have, uh, and every president has sort of what their vision is of a future Middle East. I'm not sure what the Obama doctrine is. I call it the Darwin doctrine because it's basically a doctrine in which the most vicious survive. And that's what, been Syri that's what Syria has been about. It's been the survival of the most vicious. And we've not, we promised the rebels, or I, I don't even like the term rebels, we promised the opposition um, arms. And I'm not telling you, you know, the Free Syria Army is, is, has been radicalized over the past year and a half. Why have they been radicalized? Because there's been a great vacuum there. We have not been helping anyone hardly. Who's been helping them? Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Basically the two fonts of funding radical Islam or political Islam around the world. So I guarantee you the same type of opposition that we would consider our allies are not the same ones that Qatar is going to be filling their pockets with money and cash or Saudi Arabia. Now there may be some overlap there since obviously diplomatically they are our allies. But if you look ideologically the way those countries are run internally, they are not democracies. Saudi Arabia, as our commission uh, has written about repeatedly, is one of the world's most egregious violators of religious freedom. Qatar now is I would argue actually if you look on countries influencing the shape of the Arab awakening around the world, Qatar is probably leading those lists. Why? If you look, they're investing billions into influence operations, not only within the region, but globally. They just bought Al Gore's network for uh, half a billion dollars, a network worth probably 5% of that. But yet they invested in it because they see that 
promulgating the ideas of political Islam and their vision of a Middle East, which is Islamic hegemony through the region and globally, is going to bring them dividends in the end. And this is what we're up against. And, and if you look at the history in the Middle East, as complicated as it may seem to you, and I think Syria is basically a um, clinic in what happens in American absence, what happens in uh, letting the old power structures play it out, and what the real problem is at the root cause. So if we're not looking at the finger, but we're looking at the moon, what, what is a vision for the Middle East? So far, the vision has been, you know, I have a chapter in my book, I talk about changing the paradigm. The old paradigm, and I think uh, uh, Secretary Rice laid this out very well in 2005 in her speech in Cairo, where she said, for too long we have traded uh, freedom for security and gotten neither in the Middle East. And she talked about the fact that, you know, ultimately for too long, because of the Cold War, we made alliances with dictators, with monarchs, and we sort of said that, well, as long as internally there's no kinetic war going on between states, uh, between Israel and Egypt, or between uh, other sectarian divisions, that at least we have the stability. I would tell you that if you look at Syria, you have, Iraq was the same thing. Iraq is a mess now because as much as we liberated them from Saddam, each of these countries has long been, and I, I hate to use a term that may be charged because of what happened in Boston, but a pressure cooker. And these countries have been pressure cookers of radicalization, of devaluation of their human assets as they've had you know, brain drains, and basically a Darwinian evolution. And the Arab awakening has sort of reset that and we have an opportunity. And, and basically my message to you is that we can either be a part of that change in the Middle East, or we can just sort of sit back, get the popcorn, and let Russia, Iran, China, India guide economically, intellectually, their principles, and you're gonna see the Arab awakening. I, I don't even call it a spring. There's no spring happening in the Middle East, but it is an awakening of a people that wanna be free. And that awakening can either be driven toward liberty, towards freedom, which is not a light switch that'll turn on overnight, which needs liberal institutions, civil society-based institutions to be built, or we can just sort of let it devolve, as you saw in Iran. Remember, Iran had its revolution in 79, and it devolved into an Islamic revolution. And as most Muslims I know will tell you, there's very little Islamic about it other than what the Khomeinists and the Imams there will tell you they think is Islam. And I think ultimately, this is what I would call a third pathway. Right now, every time, you know, still, we, uh, I do a lot of media talking about this, and I keep getting posed with the fact that we are stuck with two choices. Either you have a dictator, or you have the Brotherhood and Islamic uh, movements. Egypt, same thing. We saw Revolution 1.0 in Egypt back in March 2011. We all supported it because you saw finally a people trying to shed the yoke uh, of dictatorship, and we, we cheered it on and we saw millions in the streets, and then ultimately they went to elections, and unfortunately this administration has defined democracy too much. We've let it be defined as elections. And as you all know, democracy is not about elections. You know the old saying, I think Ben Franklin said, uh, you know, elections, democracy defined as elections is three wolves and a sheep deciding on what's for dinner, right? I mean, that's not democracy. Ultimately, liberal institutions of democracy are what make a democracy. And that takes time. You don't, uh, I can tell you, having parents that were educated in Syria, my grandfather would not have been who he was if he hadn't actually left Syria and got his education in London, at, uh, at London University. And then my father went there for a few years and they had to pull him out to come back as my grandfather was in and out of house arrest and his businesses were taken over by the Ba'athists, his newspaper was shut down, and Syria had 20 different presidents between 1949 and 1960 coup after coup after coup. So what you're finding now is the Arab awakening has opened the pressure cooker and you are going to have this settling out of power forces, tribal conflicts, sectarian divisions that will start to be meted out. And we can either advocate for liberty and start to take sides within this battle or we can just sort of let it play out and it'll probably only get worse. But I would tell you it is in many ways a bigotry of low expectations for us to say that, well, 
let's just, you know, they can't deal with uh, democracy. We just have to find the, the enemy we know is better than the enemy we don't. Or we don't know whether Al-Qaeda is going to take over Syria, so let's just continue to help Assad. Or, you know, this whole, whole paradigm that our interests, you know, are, are predominated by picking the lesser of two evils. I find not only as an American, I think, to be bad policy, but I find it in a, bit, a bit immoral, right? I mean, a lot of what we do globally is to give other people the opportunities that we have. Now, I know there's a lot of costs involved and other things, but I think ultimately when you look at free markets, look at how much money we're dumping into the aid of refugees right now in Syria or outside of Syria. We're going to end up paying for it somehow because that's what America does. So either we continue to dump aid into societies that are going to devolve into dictatorships, or we try to help them cure their condition from within. And I think the, the bigger problem, and we're not going to solve today what to do about whether we hit Syria tomorrow or next week. All I can tell you, the one message I did want to give you on that is that if you're going to hit an Arab dictator, you do it strong, you degrade their military capability to have a decisive action. You don't do a partial blow because that's actually our families. They were talking to me almost every day once we decided to do an act, the day President Obama said he was going to go to Congress, they won't even talk to me anymore. They're like, you're a waste of time. You know, they, they find that to be dangerous because once we've done something and we say we're not going to do any more, that'll actually give Assad a green light to do even worse than he's been doing because nobody's going to really hold him accountable. But I think the bigger question for all of us in, in universities and, and activist groups nationally and globally is, you have a quarter of the world's population that are Muslim. And the question is, is this battle within, I believe, is very similar to the battle that happened in the West through enlightenment and the separation of church and state. Not the separation of public activism. You know, there's this concept now in 21st century America that the separation of church and state means no public respect or, or this sort of hyper-secularism, I call it. You know, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the concepts that developed the Establishment Clause in our, in our Constitution where you had devout Christians who said they did not want theocrats running government. And that same process can happen within the Muslim consciousness. And I'll tell you, it's all about identity. Right now, the reason Hamas won elections, the reason the Brotherhood won elections, even though they're 25% of the population in Egypt, is there were no alternatives. The secularists, the liberal thinkers in society were so divided between communists, socialists, free marketeers, atheists, you know, all these different religious groups. The cops in Egypt had their own political group. There were so many divisions. The one group that was pretty united was the Brotherhood, the Islamic groups. And this is why it's very valid to be concerned about what's going to happen after the dictators leave. But this is the formula, this is the equation that these dictators created so that they could legitimize emergency law and military law over their population. So at some point you have to break that cycle and give the populations time in order to repair all of that. And I think ultimately, if you look at my own history, my parents uh, escaped Syria, came here to the U.S., and I found that I was able to practice my faith more freely here than in any of what my aunts and uncles described as the environment in the Middle East. And I slowly started to realize that Political Islam, what, what is political Islam? Let me define it for you. Political Islam is those who seek to establish a legal system in the state and in the government which is guided by Islamic law. So it's two things. One is a government guided by Islamic law, and two is the identity of the state is as an Islamic state. So basically the Islamists, just like you have socialists, communists, etc., there's Islamists. The Islamists believe that the state should have an Islamic identity. So our formula in the West, which is that government, we each have inalienable rights that come from God, not from Christianity or from a single faith, but from God individually. That is a different construct for society from the Islamists, and Islamists are, are very diverse. You're going to find in Tunisia what we, some in Congress, have called the moderate Islamists. I, I would personally believe it's sort of like saying there's a moderate communist there. You know, there are some violent communists and Soviets, and there's some more less violent, but to me they're all immoderate in their political ideology. Same thing with Islamists. Their, their vision in which they see government and society is that every individual in society gets their rights not from God, but from Islam and from the Imam's interpretation of Islam. So to them, their, their sense of democracy is 
what they call ulama, or as the scholars of Islam, sit down in a governing council per se, or an oligarchy, and they may vote, and this is where you'll find in their interpretations that somehow there are democratic principles in an Islamic state, but ultimately it's a very clerical driven society, clerically legally driven society, but it's not a democracy where every individual has equal access to the law. And I think this is, as much as that may sound esoteric, the identity with which the individuals in an Islamic state get their oxygen. Their oxygen of their identity is that they're doing things for their faith, their Islamic identity, they're Muslims who unite. And this is the concept that to me is the biggest threat to world security. If you look at Nidal Hassan, joined our, our army, uh, served as a psychiatrist, his bio was frighteningly similar to mine, and, and yet, at the end of the day, he became our greatest enemy and, and committed a horrific act of terror and treason against our soldiers, killing 13 and injuring over 30. And I have a whole chapter devoted to his radicalization and, and what I think we can learn from it, because again, the, the message with his radicalization is not one guy who got radicalized on the internet by Imam Awlaki, who by the way was also radicalized in the United States, but it's not about one person. It's about this guy getting sucked into this concept that America is anti-Islam, anti-Muslim. He didn't go to bed one night a moderate, loving America and wake up the next day an Al-Qaeda operative. This was a process over years of radicalization. And where it started was where his identity, his identification was that America was against Muslims and against Islam and that somehow he had to become more loyal to the global Muslim community. Broaden that out, look at the 56 countries that are Muslim majority. They hate each other, many of them, when it comes to regional politics, Iran and Pakistan, and they can't stand one another. They're, they're at the edge of war sometimes. And yet they came together and formed the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They formed it for one reason, was to keep the West the non-Muslim majority countries on the defense because they unite based on the identification of their citizens as Muslims, the majority of their citizens. Now within each of their countries is huge movements of Muslims that don't want that. Look in Iran, you had a green revolution in 2009 of people that rose up against the theocracy in Iran. Egypt, same thing. You had 10 times the number of Egyptians rise up against the Muslim Brotherhood in one year of their rule that said they didn't want to be run by a theocracy that ultimately they even said they wanted Mubarak back, which is you know, not really what they wanted, but they said this is worse. And I've always said what, what Nasser, who was a, a, a vicious dictator, what Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak could not do to the Brotherhood, the Brotherhood themselves in a more open society did to destroy their ideas. And I think this is the message there is that if you want to defeat political Islam, it is a tox you know, it is a intoxicant, if you will. And it is the drug that I find, you know, that's what my book is about, that's what the biggest battle is, is the intoxicant of Muslim identification with the political movement is, is extremely, uh, uh, I think, threatening to Western society and our mission, as far as liberty is concerned. Because in the West, we believe in the nation state. We believe that ultimately pluralism our equal access to government, and that our legal system, when we argue law, we argue law based in reason. You may be empowered, we may be empowered by our religious beliefs, but when we go to Congress or our state legislatures, we argue it based in reason. We convince, regardless of what faith the other person we're arguing against, we convince them that we are right based on the merits of our argument, not based on the fact that we interpret Genesis so-and-so or interpret uh, the fifth chapter of the Quran to mean so and so. That's the way the clerics argue in their you know, description of Islamic law. But ultimately the West did away with canon law and government and said that we want to have systems based in reason. And I would tell you that until we know how to find our allies within the Muslim community that are looking at having Muslim identity become secondary to the nation state's identity, we're not going to win this battle. And right now in the Middle East, the nation state identity is being dominated by fascist parties. To tell me right now, or the reason Muslim Brotherhood got the following it did, they looked on the ballot. Who was number two on the ballot in Egypt? It was Mubarak's old intelligence chief, right? So you had here the NDP, the National Democratic Party in Egypt, offering up the alternative to the Islamic State. 
which is a fascist Egyptian Arab nationalist state. That's not going to win votes. I can tell you my family can't stand the Islamic movement. And in Syria, if, some, if an Assad holdover runs for office, they're not going to vote for him. But yet there's no third, there's no third pathway. And, and this third pathway of liberty and freedom is one we have to work on. The problem is, is the current policy among many of us here in Washington has been to not take sides within the Muslim community. There are many versions of Islam out there. Uh, you know, certainly my Islam, uh, as a devout Muslim who, who fasts and prays, and I have a letter at the end of my book to my kids, basically telling them why I believe we need to take on this battle within the House of Islam. But we can't do this without your help. And the reason is, is not that I expect you to figure out the theology if you're not Muslim, but the, the West has gone through this. Now I hear many say that, well, who's to say that Western democracy is the only form of democracy? Fine, you know, maybe Islamic democracy deserves a shot at it. I don't think we should make, you know, this week Egyptians were arguing whether the brotherhood should be made illegal. The last thing you need to do is give them the chance to declare themselves to be victims or martyrs. You know, keep them legal just as we did the Communist Party in America and, you know, other places. You, you defeat bad ideas with good ideas, not by making them victims and locking them up and persecuting them. And I think ultimately this is, if you look for a doctrine, we need a liberty doctrine in the Middle East. We need, whether it's Democrat or Republican, policies where we start to take sides domestically in these countries and we empower women's groups, secular liberal groups, religious groups that are non-Islamists that say they'll take on the Muslim Brotherhood. And our work in America, for example, has been very, you know, we've had some major obstacles. Uh, this is not just something in the Middle East. I mean, America to me is the place where I can do this work the best. I might get threats from various groups, but it pales in comparison to what my family is experiencing in Syria. You know, so ultimately, if we want to win this, we need to start helping, I think, and driving and stimulating Muslims in America that breathe and understand the oxygen of liberty, as my grandfather used to call it. He used to say, geez, you know, I don't, he'd talk to all of his American friends here and say, you guys really don't understand and appreciate what you have in this country. And ultimately, I think we need to, you know, most of the Muslim groups in America have been dominated by what I call Muslim Brotherhood legacy groups that were started by you know, petrodollars in the 60s with the Muslim Student Association and now are driven by groups that are focused on Muslim victimization. You know, telling the NYPD that we're anti-Muslim, telling uh, uh, the federal government that they're Islamophobic, all these kind of concepts that get promulgated in order to shift the discussion away from internal Muslim reform and make it seem like we as Muslims are monolithic and all think the same. And I can't, I mean, one of the most offensive things I see in media is how when we talk about Muslims, especially, you know, I don't mean to be partisan, but more left of center, it almost seems as if we all think the same. That somehow, you know, Muslims must be offended by this movie or this uh, thing, and somehow we are not diverse. And we are just as diverse as any community. And yet, equating fighting the brotherhood becomes fighting Islam. And nobody wants to do that, so you end up having no free speech. And I think that's really what has been the biggest obstacle. So I think ultimately, as we look at solutions, you know, it's very easy to claim that, well, this is a Muslim issue. Let's forget about it. Let's just, we can't fix the Syrian problem. It's very simple. This is about modernity versus theocracy. It's about liberty versus autocracy. And there are many Muslims, I think, that live and breathe democracy here that often don't want to take this on because of what they see happens to groups like ours, and we can talk about that during the Q&A. But uh, yeah, we get targeted. I get told I'm against, I'm anti-Muslim. I get told that somehow, uh, you know, I'm advocating for the discrimination against Muslims just because I disagree with the Islamists. And we have to change that narrative. And it's all about narrative. Look at the last week in the newspapers. Front page of the New York Times shows the rebels cutting off the heads of Syrian soldiers. Uh, these could be rebels that were released from prison. It could be defectors who the Syrian government decided they wanted to uh, basically use as bait. We don't know what the reality is. And yet our whole mood and, and opinion of what's happening in Syria gets shifted based on that. So ultimately, uh, you know, there's a lot there, but, you know, I hope you can help us with this. And if you have Muslim contacts, direct them towards our American Islamic Forum for Democracy. And uh, I'd be, I'd love to take your questions. Thank you.
The only bad question is the one you leave with here, you leave here with without asking. Yes. Dr. Jaster, I'm uh, Philip Crabtree. I'm a student with the uh, PR and Corporate Communications program here. Um, I'm also an Army Public Affairs officer, um, but I won't interject military <laughs> talk into this so much. But I am interested in what your opinions are about whether or not the U.S. ought to consider military intervention in Syria, um, as you said the President is going to address tomorrow, and uh, Congress is debating currently this week now that they're back in session. Um, yeah, I've been pretty consistent on this from the beginning, is, is I think we, the difference between Syria and Iraq is we clearly don't need to have troops inside Syria. There's no doubt, or the term you're probably getting sick of hearing is boots on the ground. Um, because you have an uprising, you have a majority of the population that does not want this regime that is doing whatever they can. They're going to be able to change this government on their own. Now, is it going to be a mess? Yes, it will be. But there's a fork in the road right now. And that fork in the road is to either let Assad continue or help the, the organic uprising take over or give them room to begin to take over. I think if you degrade Assad's capability, I, I think it's a very appropriate thing to do. And I look at things morally. You know, I, I visited the Holocaust Museum for the first time. Uh, I had been to the one in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem, but I had never been to the one here until our commission went and visited six weeks ago. And what amazed me is the part I didn't realize is how much on the front pages of the newspapers our country knew about what was happening. And yet we didn't do anything for, for so many years. And uh, millions and millions of, of Jews ended up dying before we, we did anything. And I think if you look, who is going to advocate? All, all they need is if you look at the satellite images of Syria right now, it looks worse than Berlin. I mean, it is, it is just pockmarked with neighborhoods that have been destroyed. I mean, this has been the method of the Assad regime. So if you take out their runways, you take out their helicopter ships, their you know, missile launchers that they've had, that's all they need. General Keene has laid out, I think, an appropriate method over one to two weeks. Now, one day of bombing is what I've heard. That, that is, a pinprick will make things worse, as the Wall Street Journal laid out. But two weeks of concerted bombing to destroy their military capabilities will give the, and what you can do is create a region in Syria initially where we have some of our allies, especially in the Kurdish area and in the southeastern area. The northern area, right, Aleppo sort of a cutoff there. You have a lot of Islamists, the Liber Islamic Liberation Front in northeast, I'm sorry, northwestern Syria. That's going to be probably the last part. But we can get, I think, start, uh, already I heard in Jordan we've been training some of the rebels uh, and uh, shipping them back into Syria to, uh, as far as how to do this. Um, but I think if you look at morally, the choice of do nothing versus at least giving them some air cover is uh, it's a no-brainer. We need to do a no-fly zone, and that's all they need because currently most of the destruction done on innocence has been done from the air. Uh, but uh, maybe I'm biased on that, but I think regionally, uh, Iran will look at it. Uh, to us, I think policy-wise, Iran looks at this as a test case. What will the U.S. do? if uh, uh, they develop nuclear weapons, if weapons of mass destruction are used in the region and we don't do anything about it. I think this is a, a place in which we can... Uh, Israel has had four operations in Syria in the last year, and they've not had any blowback. I keep hearing from both sides in Washington about, well, we're going to get blowback and Hezbollah is going to do terror operations. Certainly that might be part of the equation, but last I checked, we don't negotiate with terrorists, so I, don't, I hope the threat of terror, if anything, that proves my point. Uh, that Assad is close to terror, uh, uh, terror groups and that he is able to pull that trigger. Uh, as we knew, Al-Qaeda, Assad today, uh, to this, uh, uh, I can't even call Charlie Rose a journalist anymore, but you know, this interview that he gave, uh, he was basically say, talking about terrorism threatening us, that another 9-11 may happen. Well, I thought, you know, if you look at Iraq, Al-Qaeda used Syria as a hub in which to kill Americans. So I thought he was a victim of Al-Qaeda. And yet, you know, we, we seem to ignore that whole, uh, I think, very sick relationship between dictators and Al-Qaeda. So if you want to get rid of Al-Qaeda, the best way is through Assad first. Yes. Hi. So you talked about how the Islamic community, it's very heterogeneous and diverse. But at the same time, it seemed to me that when you talk about this Western mission, you generalize 
the idea of Western, that Western society has of itself. And I don't know if Western society should or not question this mission, but I think it's already doing it. So it was like the lecture was amazing on seeing the other side, but this side, you know, whether the United States and whether Western society should or not get involved, we already saw um, Great Britain not wanting to be involved. So where are we going as a Western society? Do we want to be involved in this or not? Is it convenient for us? I understand your linkage. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so, so you're right. Let me take off my Syrian American hat for a second. And uh, actually, my family, I talked to them. They don't want bombing because it's like the cancer patient that doesn't want chemo because they could die from it. You know, they they just want this to stop. Um, but from an American interest perspective, Libya actually, you could have made the argument, was not. Libya had very few regional problems. We intervened in Libya because we were afraid of the possibility of a massacre of their own people. Syria is actually much more regionally, Syria is not an ally of the West. Syria is a, now a client state of Iran. Iran has openly talked about the destruction of Israel, about not recognizing the existence of Israel or the Holocaust or any of that. So you have the empowerment of a government that clearly is part of a, a, a movement in the Middle East that would like to spread as far as possible. Hezbollah similarly uh, has not been necessarily contained to Lebanon. Uh, so you know, I think ultimately if we continue to ignore this, at some point Israel is going to be threatened in which we may be called upon. Or if Iran decides to get nuclear weapons, are we going to allow them to do that? And you hear on the Hill lately a lot of people saying, well, the target should be Iran. You know, I, that is a huge war. I mean, you talk about declaring war in Iran, that's going to be bigger than Iraq was. So why not contain? I mean, in many ways, you, you have a choice of appeasement or containment. And I, I promise you, I'm not saying this just as a Syrian. You know, we were hoping that all America needed to do initially was provide arms potently to the Syrians, to the Syrian people. But when we didn't do that, now you've basically unleashed You've created a proxy war with Iran that wasn't there. Iran was not funding and arming and providing. Their first soldiers from Iran came about six months ago into Syria because Assad was limping and, and on his last breaths, and now he's regained a lot of that power because of Iran. So you have a regional conflict that's going to continue to expand. You have the Persian Gulf involved there with Saudi versus Iran. You have the Sunni Shia sectarianism involved. So if we're going to, we have to play out. This is a chess match, as I was talking to Brad before. And so far, our moves are only like, we're only thinking one move ahead. There's six, seven moves ahead you have to start thinking about. If Iran annexes Syria, and you have the Saudis, the Qataris, and the Gulf Sunni states starting to, the, to be very concerned about the advancement of the Shia uh, uh, hegemony in the region of that arc into Lebanon, and you have Israel left to defend itself, what's the future of that? And, and I think ultimately this is the time in which you, Syria, if there was ever a state in the Middle East that could have been a future pluralistic democracy, it would have been Syria because it's so diverse with the communities I laid out for you versus a lot of the other countries that are much more homogenous and less diverse that would demand a more diverse government. So in many ways, you know, I think you could have had a solution and you still can. I mean, Syria is a lot more radicalized today than it was a year ago, but if you allow it to devolve, Look at the threat to America now with the jihadists flowing into Syria. You have a guy from Phoenix arrested for helping the jihadists in Syria. Uh, Europeans, there's articles in the BBC and others talking about all the jihadists coming back to Europe from Syria. So in the community we live in now, ignoring Syria is not going to be a problem that isn't going to come back to us to, to haunt us at some point. But that's a good question. That is the real debate. Yes? I have a question of about um, about the international uh, about, about the consequences of declaring war. Well, I mean, of attacking Syria in light of international law, uh, because it looks looks like according to the news, if Obama decides to do this, there will be legal consequences. And even though it can be seen as civil disobedience, I've never heard of civil disobedience on the level of an entire country's policy. 
So I don't know what would be the effect. I missed the civil disobedience part. What do you, um, what do you mean by that? Usually civil disobedience is done by a small group of people, not the head of the state. So I'm just wondering what would be the consequences. Who are they saying? Because are you talking about the Syrian population civil disobedience? No, or? no, 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 no. Obama, in light of there have been arguments about international law, oh. and if Obama oh, decides to do this, there will be huge consequences. That's the implication. But those consequences were never specified in the articles. Yeah, I think, you know, ultimately. Uh, uh, I'll leave it to the lawyers to decide what specifically constitutionally is in conflict and when isn't it. Uh, I think there's been a lot of precedents in American history just in the past 20 years <coughs> of operations, whether it was Grenada or, or uh, Bosnia or other places where the, the, the president has not uh, gotten an authorization of war. I will tell you that uh, I do think that my own humble interpretation as a non-lawyer of a declaration of all-out war from Congress is very different than, I mean, because actually then you could make an argument that any time we arm oppositions around the world that are looking to regime change, that we would have to have the Congress declare war because we are actually being involved in domestic movements to change governments. Now, if we start dropping the bombs, obviously that ratchets it up a bit. But I think targeted operations, especially from the you know, UN Convention Against the Use of Chemical Weapons, I think clearly there's been international law violated. Now, you can make the argument who did it. Uh, you know, it's obvious to me that the rebels could never have weaponized or launched the rockets. Now, were those defecting uh, uh, Syrian officers? Bottom line is, is that first thing I'm hearing from my family is you know, whether they were gassed or raped or tortured, over 110,000 have been killed. Uh, you have clearly crimes against humanity that have been committed that were, were perpetrated for the most part by the, the Syrian government. So uh, I would tell you that from a national security perspective, whether you're looking at the chemical weapons in Syria, you're looking at the, the threat of terrorism, and the advocacy, because left to these types of definitions, basically then we're, you have to resign yourself to the Darwin theory that we, nobody will ever help those that seek freedom in these countries that ultimately rise up. Because for a long time, before my grandfather passed away and they left Syria, he actually, our family became very bitter because of the price we, the Jassers, especially in Aleppo, paid you know, for fighting the Ba'athists. You know, he left and said, you know, listen, every people deserves the government it has. And, and they used to be very frustrated. I wish my grandfather was alive to see this Arab awakening in Syria because he used to be so frustrated at how much the will had been broken of the Syrian people. So when the people finally rise up, how do you protect them from evil? And, and you know, I think that is, uh, Congress, uh, unfortunately, if we had had this debate two years ago, I think the will of Congress uh, would have been a lot stronger right now. They're just now, 65% of Americans two months ago, from a, a study I can send you, did not know where Syria was on a map. So it's gonna be hard after Iraq and Afghanistan to, to get Americans overnight, all of a sudden, because they used chemical weapons, they knew they used it in Halabja and Iraq and elsewhere, and they're like, well, why, this doesn't work. We've, been, we've seen that, done that, you know, strike one and strike two, strike three, we're not doing it. So uh, I can understand public opinion. Uh, it's, just, it's just unfortunate that it's, it's so late in which the president's making this case. I think it could have been made very well. I know I didn't answer your question, but uh, obviously, I think there's enough precedent not to, not to get approval. I would have just done it. Yes. I appreciate your talk very much. Uh, you made an argument for the restoration of reason within Islam that sounded a little bit like the one that uh, the last pope tried to make uh, uh, a few years ago caused such a furor. Um, a thousand years ago, uh, the, the Islamic culture was the, the pinnacle of economics and uh, uh, reason, medicine, um, invented algebra, right? Uh, great respect for reason. Um, today, there are huge theological obst obstacles to, to, to that. How do you see the way back to uh, Islamic culture that respects reason? That's a great question. And, uh, um, you know, what happened, and, and Bernard Lewis has a great book on this that's pretty short, actually. It's called What Went Wrong. And if you look at Islamic history, there was this enlightenment period, what I call the first enlightenment of the Islamic world from the time after the, you know, around 7, 800 to 1400 or 12 to 1400. But then 
There's what we call ishtihad in Arabic. Ishtihad means the critical interpretation of scripture in light of modern day. So ishtihad means sort of a, a, a dynamic at the time in which, remember most of Islamic history was actually not theocracy, it was mostly dynasties. Uh, so under those dynastical rules, you had, there was at one point in which uh, um, Paul Johnson in the book The History of the Jews calls, in Jewish history calls it the golden age of Judaism, was under some of that rule. Now I'm not saying it's like American democracy, there, there was different laws for different faiths, and, but again, nowhere in the world at that time was there a, a American revolution or an enlightenment hadn't happened yet, there were no successful uh, secular societies. Uh, so the, I think that you're comparing apples to oranges uh, in which in some points they, they use the description of what used to happen to Christians or Jews as being an example of being backward. Well, yeah, compared to America in 2013, it certainly is, but compared to everywhere else in the world, it was thriving. So what happened? How do we march that back? I think if you look at the disease itself, there were 4,000 schools of Islamic law in 1000, 1100, that slowly whittled down into the Sunni tradition. Now we have four schools, which are basically not very different. And in the Shia tradition, another four schools, and, and basically that's it. And then you have Sufis and, and other in the diversity. But this, this critical thinking, I remember my dad telling me that he was kicked out of his school for asking his teacher in 11th grade why we didn't use American Jeeps in Syria versus Russian Jeeps. And he, that's all he asked. And, and he was kicked out of class for a week because he, he was wondering why we got all our, all our jeeps from Russia and Syria and those didn't seem to work very well in cold weather while he had heard that the American ones worked better. And this critical thinking, the tribalism, there's a whole chapter in a book about tribalism where the, the critical thinking dynamic disappeared. And that, the internet, YouTube, Facebook revolution, I think is going to change where you have people, young women's group especially, questioning the authority of these paternal tribal cultures and, and changing a lot of that dynamic. And I think ultimately once they start to get their confidence, they'll start to question uh, the interpretations of so-called passages in the Quran that I don't believe say this, but you know, the men of even mosques in this country will interpret it as saying, well, you know, uh, domestic violence, beating your wife is okay as long as you don't lift your elbow off your your waist and crazy things like that. But actually there's a passage there that I think needs healthy debate is whether a woman gets half a vote in, in a, a religious court or not, which is actually laid out. Women get a quarter of the inheritance, for example, uh, that the sons get, than the daughters. So these are things that are ingrained currently in most interpretations. The reason it's backwards, I will tell you, is petrodollars, pure and simple, is that the Saudis, the Qataris, if you look at Al Jazeera, you talk to reporters that used to work there. If you start to, I mean, Al Jazeera right now is putting a nice American face on what they're doing. If you go to the Arabic and look at Kardawi, Imam Kardawi, who is probably one of the most influential clerics in the world, he advocates a lot of these things that we talk about needing reform. And these are the guys that are on the payroll of these royal families. And, and ultimately, until you start investing in liberal institutions, you're not going to change any of this. And when we went and talked to the Saudis as part of the U.S. Commission, you know, we asked them, well, why is there so much hate against Jews and against the West written in their books? Their fix is to white out a few lines. You know? And I'll tell them, you, know, you can't take Mein Kampf and white out a few lines. You have to change the entire, the entire mindset, which is to liberalize, which would mean them being out of power. Because what happens is the royal family claims that they're victims of the conservative movement and if they, if they then allow the liberalization, the conservatives will have a revolution and you'll have basically Wahhabis running Saudi Arabia versus the royal family. So again, they say we're stuck, we can't empower them. And all I can say is that you need to open up those societies and until the money, it's all about the money, until the money flow flows towards liberal institutions, now you'll have naysayers on the right also that'll say, well, the Zudi Jassers of the world are mutations, they're just sort of, most Muslims have to live under Islamic states. I think Egypt proved that wrong three weeks, four weeks ago, or maybe it was two months now. Uh, but, but ultimately, the issue is, is will we fund, will we start investing in anti-Islamist, non-Islamist, non-Wahhabi Muslim groups that can start to fund you know, these types of thinkings? I, and I tell my kids, and in my book I write, I'm not going to fix the Sharia problem. 
the, the Sharia that calls for Hadood punishments of stoning, uh, throwing homosexuals off cliffs, which is part of the law in Iran. Uh, you know, all these things which most Muslims don't want to talk about, which is part of our Sharia. You know, it's not my Sharia, but it is part of Sharia that's a lot of normative Sharia that needs to be countered. That's not going to be fixed in my lifetime. That needs schools first that then train imams, then those imams start to rewrite Sharia. That's going to take generations. But what can happen in my lifetime is the separation of mosque and state, where you get the imams and the clerics out of government, out of uh, activism and political movements, and you, you put back the concept of reason into running government, and then slowly you'll start to penetrate the ideas of freedom into uh, the religious institutions that are really the bigger. Our, our bigger problem, as I've said in national media multiple times, is we have a leadership problem. And unless you stop funding those leaders, they're going to continue to regenerate what they're doing. Yes. Good evening, uh, Dr. Yes. Joshua. My name is Fiazan. I'm a student at the Semester at Washington program. Uh, Hillary Clinton today talked about a proposal to stock all the chemical weapons uh, under the c control of the international community. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's uh, an effective alternative to uh, military intervention in Syria? Um, I certainly am in favor of anything that'll get the chemical weapons depots out of Syria, which was our whole mission in Iraq, right? I think a lot of those came from Iraq. Um, that's not going to solve the Syrian problem. Uh, the civil war is going to go on for, for years until, as I told you, the human assets on one side disappear. The, the opposition is not going to stop until the Assadists are out of power. So it may solve our problem right now for some reason, yes. I mean, I guess I understand the, the convention against the use of chemical weapons because it um, in many ways unleashes the worst types of killing, but killing is killing. and and. Uh, I'm not sure I understand why the red line wasn't 50,000 or 70,000, and, and I, I guess I just don't get that. But uh, I think it's definitely a step. Of, get those weapons because they could be used against Israel, they could be used against uh, our allies, and more against the, the Syrian people. But that's not going to solve the, the bigger problem in Syria. Yes. Um, Dr. Jesser, uh, I want to thank you for your great speech. Um, I'm a student uh, at the Semester in Washington program. Uh, my name is Yu Tianpeng. Um, so in your speech, you suggested that there should be a third solution, which is to um, actively intervene in Syria by creating or supporting liberal groups that can stand up to the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so my first question to that is, uh, who do you think should be the enforcer of such intervention? Um, and secondly, I think the capacity building of such liberal groups require time and resources. And what do you suggest in terms of a more immediate way to help with the situation in Syria? Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, you know, we can either just throw money at the refugees or, or start to target that. I mean, look in Egypt, for example. We gave $250 million just to the election process. I, if, you, if you had read Saad Ibrahim, Saad Ibrahim was one of the main Islam anti-Islamist reformers in Egypt, and he wrote in the Wall Street Journal in an interview and then in a column, said, please don't, have don't let them have elections for at least four years in Egypt. And they had it in six months, and he said, that's too quick. The, the Brotherhood's going to win that. And sure enough, they did. And, and we ended up dumping a lot of money just into election polling monitoring, when I, I think it should have been into helping them learn how to form political parties with united ideologies. The reason the Islamists won in Tunisia was there were 70 different parties that formed after the, the king left. And uh, the, the Islamists and Nahda formed 20% of the population and they won. So part of that, I think, is investing in civil society. Who should be part of that? I think, as Senator McCain has called for, why not start to form a, a united coalition globally of democracies that start to do this? I mean, look at Eastern Europe. After the Soviets pulled out, you saw wonderful success stories, and, and there's people here who know about that better than I, but you know, Estonia and, and, uh, and a lot of the former uh, satellite countries that we were very instrumental in helping teach them how to build the infrastructure of democracy, economically and politically. And uh, I think similarly, why not get Europe? I mean, when the, when the revolution started, I was trying to get Europe and, our, and Washington to identify Assad family members that needed to have their assets frozen 
and it took us months until they, and, and actually it took a year until they actually froze some of the assets of the Assads and, and a lot of their allies who were all war criminals for years. And now that's all been done, but it's been two years later. And uh, at the meantime, they shifted a lot of their assets to probably into Russia and into uh, China and elsewhere. So, uh, you know, I think there are ways to do it because if we don't, Saudi Arabia and Qatar right now, as I said, are funding the Islamist groups. They're not going to fund, I mean, up until a month ago, actually, when President Obama declared that we were going to start helping the, the opposition and arming them, and, uh, um, or at least we said non-lethal, but I think we're talking about lethal aid in some ways, Saudi Arabia on that day, the next day, stopped funding the Islamic Liberation Group that was the 37,000 I was telling you about that are not Al-Qaeda, but almost. And they said because they wanted us to help. So they knew that once we were involved, they were going to stop helping the Islamic radicals that they were helping. So our involvement at least tempers moving things in the better direction than our lack of involvement. Hi, my name is Bria. Is this one? Um, I'm with the Semester in DC program. Yes. So my question is more domestic. You mentioned how Muslims in America should not um, bond together over a shared victimization of racial profiling against right. like, the police or um, the FBI. Well, I'm a first-gen Syrian, um, and I myself have experienced, you know, those things. And it, it's not a coincidence. I think it indexes like a greater fault in our own society. And my question is maybe we should not bond over a shared victimization, but I think that it's really important, you know, as an American to point out these occurrences because it is an example of a wider, you know, instance of racism in our society or, or of intolerance. And uh, it might not necessarily like point to forming a political entity, but I think it's extremely important for like first gens and second gens of any, you know, race or ethnicity, you know, to be able to share these stories. Well, let me, uh, thank you for asking that, and, and I apologize if, if I implied that in any ways I would want, as a Muslim, an American Muslim, to, to give away any of my civil rights. Um, and we said that in our defense. We had a press conference of our anti-Islamist groups at the steps of the NYPD in which we supported their efforts, but we, the first thing each of us said was we do not give up any of our civil rights. My issue has to do with the bandwidth of, of the attention to Islamic issues in America. If you have so much bandwidth, and you look at what's preached by the imams and Muslim groups in America today, 90%, I don't know what percent of that bandwidth is all about civil rights and, and our victimization, et cetera, and none of it's about internal reform. You ask groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations or the Islamic Society of North America or Muslim Public Affairs Council, go to their website and you'll look, most of their issues are about drones and about you know, all of this, this concept that America is at fault and the problems in the world are America's fault and you see very little, and this is why we have a credibility problem. And I would tell you, and I've said to, to endorse what you're saying, that if America gets this wrong and starts targeting American Muslims, they're going to lose the best asset they have in internal reform. Because the reason the Islamists win is that they take the mantle of religion and wrap themselves with it, and we unfortunately give it to them because we don't take them on publicly and say, you know what, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood is ruining Islam, is turning it into this theocratic oppression, and we want to counter their ideas, get women's groups to take on and ask, why do women need to, to pray in the uh, hidden closets of a mosque rather than in the front? Why, why are they mistreated in mosques and a lot of Islamic organizations? Nobody's asking these questions, which I think would get us a lot of credibility, and Americans would then realize that we were the best asset in reform and in these things, but unfortunately, our silence and the domination of this discussion by groups that want to blame everything on America has screwed up the priorities. And as a result, we're losing an opportunity to reform our own, uh, to, to lead the charge and be the head of the spear in targeting the real problem, rather than you know, spending so much time on. You know, I testified at Chairman King's hearings about American Muslim radicalization. Our entire panel was Muslim, and yet we were demonized by most of the media actually as being this Muslim witch hunt and Congressman Ellison, who I have a whole chapter dedicated to in my book, sort of said that this was, they should be talking about Christian radicalization and every other group. And, and our point was, sure, have hearings on that. But we need to fix, you know, if you look at the last 330 arrests on terrorism, 85% of them, 290 were Muslim. So it's not to say that Muslims are equated to terrorism, but if you're going to fix the problem, we have to realize that 
the, the Islamic identity is what they're hijacking and it's part of the problem that we should not be afraid to talk about in a country that formed itself on discussing religious issues very publicly. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So I'll, I'll be happy to sign your books. Uh, um, I can sit up front or wherever you'd like me to if you, if you want me to sign them. So. Sure, we just want to, we've got a couple of people who are probably going to have to make it all the way to class. Uh, so we thank you very much thank for you. being here. And they'll, anyone who can stay for some follow-up questions, it, it sounds like you would be willing to. Absolutely. Show those. Thank you so much, Dr. Jasser. We truly appreciate it. Thank you for our first lecture here in the new space. Yep, exactly. Where can I do that? Maybe what we'll do is we'll do the books here. This is actually a former colleague of mine, Maricel Morales.